Hi, I'm Marcus Grönlund. I'm one of the architects and developers of the JDK Flight Recorder, a feature included in JDK 11. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what this feature is, what it is designed to do, and give you some hands-on in order to demonstrate how it can assist us solving problems. What is the JDK Flight Recorder? The most intuitive way to understand it is to use the analogy of the recording device in an aircraft. And just like these devices record interesting events related to air travel, flight recorders intended to record events related to our programs. What is being recorded are events, and we can think of an event as some piece of data at a particular instant of time. Recording events using flight recorder allows us to persist the representation of the execution states in time periods just before and during a problem. This entails we can later go back in time, if you will, to understand what was leading up and happened just prior to some problem or less than optimal situation. The key to flight recorder is being able to record high quantities of information while keeping the overhead of the recording process low. The system is designed to run always on in mission critical environments. Another very important design goal has been to help speed up the time it takes to start the process of problem analysis, thereby cutting the overall time for issue resolution. Flight Recorder tries to accomplish this by recording information that will highlight our system from many different perspectives, ranging from informational overviews such as command line parameters, loaded modules and system properties, to some very detailed information regarding, say, the time waiting to acquire a monitor, or the time spent executing a piece of code. During subsequent analysis, we can therefore start out from a holistic perspective and drill ever deeper into the relevant details. JFR is especially apt for recording latencies. Where traditional profilers report time executing, JFR records and reports situations where the application is not executing, or at least not as effective as it could be. Another design goal is to provide insight into how programs interact with the execution environment as a whole. As you are most certainly already aware, many problems we run into are not directly attributable to logical errors in our programs, but they appear because of a confluence of many factors and relations. With Flight Recorder, we have a means to capture these usually hard to reproduce situations where a large portion only seems to surface in production environments. The most common use case is to use JFR as a background recorder, analogous to the recording device in aircraft. We can also view the flight recorder infrastructure as providing us with an always available profiler, ready to record more extensive information if needed, and maybe only for a short period of time. The actual interaction with flight recorder is very simplistic. The work we invest is done prior to and after getting the recording system running. In the former case, we design our events and metadata using the APIs. And in the latter, we make use of the recorded information in order to improve our understanding of a system at a particular time or in a particular situation. And this can be especially helpful in production environments. To get data out from Flight Recorder, we instruct it to dump the information it has already recorded and this produces a binary file, which we can view as a database in compressed format. We can use programmatic APIs for interacting with this file, and this can be useful if you already have some sense of what we're looking for. But mostly you don't. Like any good profile you put to use, it will almost invariably point you somewhere where you had no idea of even start looking. In these situations, we can enlist the help of a GUI to assist us manage and better understand the large data sets and relations. So let's use jcommand. We will use jcommand pid help and we can see five commands for interacting with jfr. The command to start recording is called jfr start. Here I've given this first recording a name called continuous because this will be the recording we will have running in the background. By having this recording running, we can send requests to dump the recorded information anytime we like, and that is exactly what we'll do here after letting it record for a while. We use the jfr dump command to get information from Flight Recorder. So let's use that here. jfr dump, name continues, file name, and let's call this one 
discovery.jfor. Let's again issue the jfor check command. Notice here that the dump operation we just completed is non-destructive in the sense that we still have a background recording running. Now just a quick note on the file we just dumped. A recording file contains much structure. In this example here we have a sample file of about 5 megs in size. I've used the APIs in JDK J4 Consumer to reconstruct the relational information into two standard file formats, JSON and XML. The file size listings give testimony to the fact that although the, the file can be transformed into these other formats, you need to be aware of the size overheads. Now we will start our analysis, and in order to properly understand the vast amount of information we have at our disposal, we prefer to use a GUI tool that will assist us with the analysis process. We will use JDK Mission Control, which is an excellent tool for doing just this. And just as with Flight Recorder, with, for JDK 11, JDK Mission Control is being open source and donated by Oracle to the OpenJDK community. We will be using an early access version of Mission Control. Let's click the Threads tab. Here, to the left, we can see threads being represented as rows in a table. Each row is projected onto the graph, representing the execution state for that particular thread. In the graph itself, we can see time plotted along the x-axis. These graphs remind me of sonar graphs. You know the kind they use in underwater seabed explorations. And just like sonar graphs help depict the contours of something we cannot directly observe, so JFR can help us see contours of hard to observe problematic execution patterns. We also see quite a number of red dots. These red dots are events. Let's inspect what kind of event it is. Java monitor blocked. Besides giving us information about how long this thread was blocked before acquiring the monitor, it also gives us information about the monitor itself. For example, it gives us the instance of the monitor, that is, it's represented by the monitor address. It also gives us the class for this instance, and here it is a Java Util hash table. In addition, it gives us information about what thread was the previous owner of the monitor. When monitor blocked events line up like this vertically, it's a clear indication of a bottleneck. It looks like most threads need to acquire this particular monitor in order to pro proceed with execution down the right, that is, along the time axis. Let's select one of these events. Here, the stack trace view provides us with great contextual information. We instantly see that this thread is blocked while executing this particular path. Mission Control also provides another view over locks, so let's check that one as well. And now let's check the code related to this. Why indeed? It looks like we're using a plain old hash table to store our log entries. With hash table being synchronized, we immediately see our mistake. Let's change it to a concurrent hash map instead. We're just about to deploy our new code, where we remember that we might want to turn on JFR from the start. We do another dump for this newly deployed code, which I'm not showing here, and we again check the threads tab. Look ma, no dots. In this example, of course, I knew where to start looking. But sometimes you don't. The good thing is that Mission Control can actually assist us with this kind of analysis. We will redo the same scenario that we just did, but that this time we will check the automated analysis results page. One rule here says lock instances Java blocking and it looks like it automatically found the how many number of threads being blocked on this particular monitor. Let's pause here. Why did we not see this until production? Either we didn't provoke enough stress during testing to increase the concurrency level to a problematic level or maybe we did do that but we did not use a tool that reported about it during the test cycle. In this situation, the code we were involved with was, a, with was our own, so we could easily change it, but it could just as well have been code located in a library that we were using. We believe J4 can be of assistance here.
helping us scale this value. Say we wanted to report this finding to the library developers. We could easily attach this recording to their bug reporting system. Now the bug report just got stronger, our argument being backed by empirical evidence. The library developers in their turn is also in a much better position. They have just received a piece of real execution about how their library is being used, and again from a production environment. Another philosophical reflection is that there was no real error involved here. We ended up in a problematic situation because we missed a few details. Let's see if we can get some additional information from this file. Let's click the memory tab. What we see here is a sawtooth graph representing heap memory usage in this VM. Each cycle consists of a build-up phase which represents a period of heap memory allocations followed by a subsequent sharp drop which represent a GC and then the cycle starts over. The frequency of this graph seems to be around 2 Hz that is we have 2 cycles per second. If we inspect this in more detail, we can see at the start of a cycle our heap usage is around 570 megs. At the end of the cycle, our heap usage has now grown to approximately 2.4 gigabytes. This gives us an allocation rate of about 4 gigs per second. Another valid inference we can make is that most of these allocations are short-lived objects. The reason for this claim is that the GC is able to push down the heap back to the startup position at each cycle. We can get another piece of important information if we click the garbage collection checkbox. Now we're presented with the information about GC pause times. What we see is that a GC has a pause time of about 20 milliseconds. What this means for us in this context is that the GC stopped our application for about 20 milliseconds to do its work. But since we have two of these GCs per second, we actually have a pause time of 40 milliseconds per second in this application. At this point we would like to understand what objects are being allocated and from where. JFR provides us with the ability to do object allocation sampling without bytecode instrumentation. But in order to get this information we will need to enlist the profiling capabilities of the JFR engine. Since the sampling mechanism has a slight overhead and can generate a lot of data, it does not turn on by default. Instead, it is included in our settings for our doing a profile recording. We will start an additional recording and we will explicitly pass uh, the settings to do a profile recording to JFR. With this heavy rate of allocation though, we only need to have a very short sample to understand what might be allocating. So we will also enlist another option that is called duration, which lets us uh, uh, schedule a time-based recording and let's just run it for one minute. At the end of this minute, JFR will stop and dump the recording to the file name we specify and here we name it allocation.jfr. We open allocation JFR in JMC and we can see that our top section has been populated by information about allocations. Here all the sample instances are grouped according to class and we can see that the top candidate seems to be a boolean array. If we mark this boolean array we can see in the stack trace below the actual allocation sites aggregating onto these allocations and here it seems that there is only one single allocation site. Let's inspect this code. This section of the application is involved in calculating prime numbers and we saw that J4 pinpointed the allocation site for the boolean arrays to the line number 35 of the Eratosthenes algorithm and here the boolean array is being used as the sifting array. Having had this site pinpointed to us by J4 as being related to high frequency of GCs and consequently of GC pause times, we can now start to think how we could make this application more effective. Maybe by redesigning this piece of code to not allocate as frequently. Maybe by using a caching technique or some kind of memoization, we would be able to much more effective. When we're involved in the analysis at this level, it's very easy to lose track of the bigger picture. We might think, well, what's 40 milliseconds? 
We should try to always remind ourselves of the concept of scale. So let's try to answer this question. What's 40 milliseconds? 40 milliseconds per second is 4%. 4% of the time, our application is not doing anything. It is paused because of GC activity. 4% of 24 hours is almost one hour. 4% of a week is almost seven hours. So seven hours per week, this application is not doing any useful work. Let's say we've deployed 100 of these instances. So 700 hours per week, our application is sitting idle. Now, if we also had some business model, we could extend this thought experiment by, by factoring in a monetary value per compute hour. So, if we can just figure out a way to maybe have just a single GC happen every second, or that we can get our pause times down to 10 milliseconds, we would have improved our effectiveness by 350 hours per week. In closing out this brief demonstration, there's one more piece that I would like to show you. As of JDK 9, we provide Java APIs that allows you to create your own application specific events into JFR. Although I will not have the time here to demonstrate how to program using the API, I would like to show you an example of what a custom event might look like. As you remember, my application had a section that involved calculating prime numbers. And here we can see a custom event I added to JFR to represent these calculations. There's a lot of details here that we might need to cover some other time. But the main takeaway message is that there is no categorical difference between this custom event and the events we've been inspecting so far. Of course, it might look that way, but that is because JMC has predefined views of some of the most general event types. This view also demonstrates another important aspect of JFR, and this is the concept of self-describing data. Here, James C. did not need any particular changes in order to display my custom event. Instead, the custom event contained the metadata for a consumer to represent this information. As a specific example, we can inspect the ratio field here. And as you can see, the tool is able to render this value as a percentage. This is made possible because the custom event has been decorated with semantic metadata that effectively says to a consumer, this value is a percentage. So let's summarize. The operations you saw me demonstrate using jcommand and j4dump are completely mechanical should ideally be handled by a monitoring tool. Such a monitoring tool could invoke dump operations as a consequence of something happening at a higher level, maybe a distributed transaction. If we can expedite the process of getting analysis started, most likely through some means of automation, the faster we can understand and solve problems. As of JDK 9, Java APIs in JDK J4 allow programs to create and integrate their own events. We really hope you like JDK 11. Thank you for watching.